It's always a pleasure to be back here in India and again, a uh, pleasure in front of all my teachers. And thank you very much for the very kind welcome and very kind words. Uh, I'm deeply honored, I'm deeply privileged and humbled to be chosen to give this talk in honor of uh, Madam Acharya. And I'm sure she's here in spirits and I can see her sitting right in front in one of the corner chairs and, and smiling and being proud of uh, how things have developed in nephrology in India and she has always been an inspiration all through my career. Uh, I don't have any, uh, th this presentation is essentially my personal views and none of the societies have endorsed anything that I say today, so uh, please be mindful of that. Uh, what I decided to talk today was take you through a journey which has essentially been my journey, uh, which started as Professor Kriplani mentioned in 86. And, and this patient, Mangu, he has left deep memories, he's etched my memories and his story will, will never be forgotten by me. And I'm sure a lot of you here in the audience can relate to what I experienced when I first started my nephrology training. Mangu was a 10-year-old child who was brought to JJ Hospital by his parents with great hopes. They came from Bihar uh, thinking that big hospital, big city, there's cure for everything. Unfortunately, he had end-stage renal disease and it was my task to explain to the patient what the options were and Unfortunately, the options were either get a transplant or a long-term maintenance dialysis. And again, in those days, in mid-80s, long-term dialysis, at least in a government hospital, was available only for patients who had a prospect for transplantation. Listening to those devastating uh, words, uh, obviously any parents would get disappointed, would get saddened. And rather than taking the child home to see him die, they decided to leave this child in the hospital and we were left with a child with uh, no support system and again uh, on, on any person's humanitarian grounds you would not let this child die so he was being dialyzed and I had to cannulate him, we did not have uh, pediatric vascular surgeons in those days and we had to, I had to put in two single lumen cannulas in his femoral vein every time he had dialysis. Those cannulas could not be sutured in and I'm sure a lot of you have done those uh, vascular access procedures and probably that's how I got interested into vascular access. And it went on for a few days when finally one of those days uh, this little child, he comes up and tells me and the people in the staff that Doc Saab kal hum chale jayenge and we kind of didn't realize what it was, but in fact, he had some kind of a premonition. And overnight, he had a complication which he could not be revived from, and he passed away. So really, this is the past. And from there, uh, where we have come, so from past, where we are at present, and I will take you through the present, especially focusing on vascular access and where we need to go with more focus on vascular access since the dialysis scenario has changed completely in India. Uh, looking back at the economic situation if, in, within the Asian countries, based on the World Bank economic classification of Asian countries, most of the South Asia, Southeast Asia falls under the lower middle income group and India is no exception. And ESRD care in India, if we have to put in a nutshell, this is where we stand. There is lack of national figures. Yes, there is data from a few centers of few regions. There was a CKD registry that was established between 2005 and 2010, but for uh, reasons that uh, I'm uh, not completely aware of, but I'm sure there were real logistic reasons that this registry could not be maintained. But having said that, we do have numbers that range anywhere from 150 to 230 incident dialysis patients per million population. 
And the projection is that each year, about 220 to 275,000 patients will start dialysis uh, in, in India. On top of that, there is lack of universal access to care. There is lack of shortage of uh, trained, qualified nephrologists, trained, qualified technicians and nurses to provide dialysis. And most of the care is provided in the private sector. And the population as such is young compared to what we see in the developed countries. So the mean age is about 49. And again, uh, with globalization, 40% of these patients do have diabetes as a reason for end-stage renal disease. And India is no different from other Asian countries. And if you look at countries like Malaysia, Thailand, uh, clearly the annual incidence is somewhere around 150 to 200 uh, thousand per, uh, uh, 150 to 200 per million population. Uh, and again, lack of uh, uh, national uh, registries uh, leads, leads to gross underestimation of the incidence. And, and this is, uh, is reflected well. I, I don't want you to read through the uh, fine print at the bottom of the x-axis, but I, what, what I want you to take home message is this map categorizes the, uh, the, the entire world into high income, upper middle income, lower middle income, and low income. The extreme right two columns are the lower middle income and uh, low income, and the red dots are the patients who are actually receiving renal replacement therapy. And the blue dots are patients who are receive uh, uh, the estimated number of ESRD. And there's a wide gap between what is required and what is actually available. If you look into the high income or the upper middle income, the gap is much narrower. And to add to this, the deaths secondary to kidney, kidney failure in India has been reported to be very high. This was, this was a disease burden study reported uh, recently in Lancet where uh, uh, ESRD ha has, been, uh, re has been the reason, eighth leading cause of death in India, with about 2.9 percent deaths between 2010 and 2013, which is almost 50 percent more than a decade ago between 2001 and 2003. And, and, and mind you, this is with a gross underestimation of the overall incidence. Uh, diabetes is, t is the largest uh, contributor, even according to uh, that study. Having given this background of where ESRD is, there has been an explosive growth, which is very heartening to know, that explosive growth of dialysis in India. And the demand has been anywhere to about 30 percent per annum. And, and most economic reports have shown that the dialysis market has increased significantly from 100 million to 150 million between 2007 and 2012. The estimated need for hemodialysis machines is huge based on at least the first year projection of 200,000 patients, the estimated need is close to 70,000 uh, dialysis machines. And the projected growth has been anywhere from 1.4 to 2.2 million. So there is, going, there is going to be a huge uh, awareness, a huge need for uh, care, to pro care to be provided to these patients who will be newly diagnosed with uh, end-stage renal disease. And it's also heartening to know that there is movement and there is uh, uh, support from uh, government agencies and uh, uh, other, other resources where the, the dialysis care has definitely increased over these past uh, few years. Uh, National Dialysis Service, which I'm sure you all are better well-versed than I am, uh, it's a subsidized hemodialysis uh, therapy uh, cost coverage from based on public-private partnership. Uh, this was recently announced about a year ago, where the private partner will basically take care of providing human resources, uh, dialysis equipments, uh, uh, reverse osmosis machines, dialyzers, and the consumables, whereas the state government will provide uh, space, power, and, and facility requirements. And, and this national dialysis service will cover some of the costs for dialysis. It's unclear, though, as to how this dialysis care will be monitored, what kind of quality of care will be provided, will there be standardization. And clearly, I did not see any uh, uh, concerns, mentions in any of the opinions, comments that have been published uh, about vascular access-related costs. And as you all know, this, this, this is nothing new for you, that vascular access is the lifeline and Achilles heel. 
if you have a good vascular access, your patients can get good dialysis. And at the same time, if, with the provision of dialysis and with the provision of improved care and, and medications that, that we provide to, to minimize the complications, everybody goes through issues that are related to vascular access. So it's a lifeline as well as an Achilles heel. And the challenges that surround the vascular access care, especially in resource-limited countries, is, is, is unimaginable. First of all, there needs to be an awareness that maintaining a good vascular access is equally important. And, and again, this audience is very well versed, but this audience is probably just 1% of the people who take care of dialysis in, 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 the, in, in, in the country and in other South Asian countries. Education is equally important, and education not just for people, uh, for physicians, but education for uh, nurses, education for technicians, education, educating the patients, educating even the primary care physicians, so that they start recognizing the need to identify chronic kidney disease and implement preventive care, rather than try to uh, treat a problem which is much later in, 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 in the uh, sequence of events. And from a health advocacy point, I think it's equally important to have guidelines and standard of care so that these are followed and the, the resources are utilized to the best possible way. Again, uh, what we already know from uh, the USRDS data that depending on the type of cath depending on the type of vascular access, the cost of maintaining patients uh, on dialysis uh, is, is different. Those patients who have catheters, they are most expensive. Uh, to manage, uh, and, and in U.S. it's anywhere from 70 to 75 thousand uh, dollars per year. Whereas those who have AV fistula, the cost of maintaining these patients per year can be much less compared to those who have uh, catheters. So clearly, what does this mean? We we really need to have a concept of vascular team to take care of vascular access related problems, and and the way I see it. Uh, nephrologists can definitely be in the center of this and work as a leader, but it is equally important that every player plays an important role and contributes to maintaining the access. So it's a vascular surgeon or a general surgeon or a urologist, whatever, whatever the uh, model that may be working in your uh, local environment. Equally important to include the primary care physicians. Equally important to include the interventionalist who's, who's a radiologist or a vascular surgeon doing it or a cardiologist doing it, the dialysis staff and technicians, and the patient himself. So the new nephrologist has to be part of this and should take the ownership of being a leader of this team. And well, if the nephrologist is interested, can become proficient with uh, procedures. Does not have to be doing procedures, but has to be fully aware of what needs to be done to monitor and access, what needs to be done to intervene to keep that access flowing. Uh, I see nephrologists as a, playing a bigger role in educating the dialysis community that he is in close contact with, creating awareness, emphasizing the importance of a functioning vascular access, and at the same time, coordinate care with various uh, stakeholders, dialysis nurses, technicians, surgeons, interventionalists, and the patient. But if the patient, if the nephrologist decides to do procedures, I think it's equally important to understand, and, and we had an excellent session uh, earlier on, which uh, did focus on some of the uh, outcomes, but it's equally important to focus on competencies and safety concerns. So the questions that, three things that came to haunt uh, the nephrology group when interventional nephrology was started in US was, can a nephrologist learn to perform procedures is it safe for the patients? Uh, when, when a nephrologist performs procedures, does he cause, he or she cause more complications? Uh, or does the, or, or is, is it equal to the, the other specialties, uh, who are, uh, other experts who perform the same procedures? And do we have any data to, to claim that? Uh, we did, uh, over a period of uh, 10 to 15 years now, we do have several successful models in uh, academic centers where uh, this has worked in collaboration with other specialties. So specialties like interventional radiology and nephrology, specialties like cardiology and uh, nephrology, they have worked together in academic settings to help train as well as manage patients. And uh, just to give you a flavor of what kind of uh, uh, 
uh, complication rates and what kind of procedures are performed. So this, this was a study uh, reported uh, recently in, in 2013 where um, uh, interventional nephrologists were performing procedures in several centers, about 65 to 70 centers all across the country. So that's why the number is really huge, about 90 to 100,000 procedures were compared to uh, procedures performed by interventional radiology uh, and, and, and the procedures performed uh, by radiologists were from selected few centers. Uh, the procedures were mainly were looked at thrombectomy, uh, angioplasties and catheters. Uh, and, and again, as you see, as, as this, this is a matter of learning the skills. As you perform more, you become more skillful and, and again, it doesn't matter if the basic training is radiology, surgery, cardiology or nephrology. And when they looked at the complications between the uh, procedures performed uh, between 2000 to 2004, which were reported in 2004, and then the decade later in 2014, uh, the number of procedures clearly have dropped even further. Minor complications that included small hematomas, um, minor ruptures that did not require a stent placement, uh, did not require any additional uh, intervention, uh, again, 3.2 percent is, is really a very small number that dropped further to about 1.1 percent. And major complications that required sending either patient to the emergency room or ligating the axis or getting a surgeon uh, or taking surgical help, again, those numbers were really, really small. So yes, if it's done properly, if the training is, a, is, is uh, given properly, then it, it doesn't matter whether the procedures are performed by radiologists nephrologists, cardiologists, vascular surgeons, urologists, whoever it is. And, and, and all of these specialties have been performing these procedures in some part of the world. So having said that, where do we need to go from vascular access focus point in future? Uh, and, and, and this is completely what I view it as. It's an ongoing challenge with vascular access care. And, and in, a play, in a country where the dialysis floodgates are going to open tremendously, uh, one has to start thinking of how the vascular access complications will be managed. And, and we can put it into three different buckets, uh, education, advocacy, and research. Education, I think education is important for all stakeholders. It's important to improve awareness. It's important to improve training for all specialties. So not all surgeons may have interest in taking care of access-related problems. Not all interventional radiologists may be interested. So if a radiologist is interested in taking care of access problem, they really need to understand the hemodynamics of an access. They really need to understand what happens in a dialysis unit. Same is true for a surgeon. Same is true for a urologist. Just because they can sew up vessels does not mean they can get a good access. Uh, so training is equally important for all specialties, and, 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 and that should be uh, a common theme. Uh, for nurses and technicians, it's important to know how to cannulate, how, uh, what kind of tools to use, what kind of interventions need to be done at what time frame, so identifying dysfunctional access timely so that they can be intervened to keep the, keep the patency. Uh, equally important is developing accreditation and certification guidelines, and, and these have to be done specific for each country. Uh, they cannot be universal guidelines. Each country has its own set of resources, own limitations, uh, own expertise, and, and that has definitely a role to play. Once there, is, once there are guidelines in place, then, then you can track standard of care and, and uh, look at the practice patterns. And, and to achieve all of that, I think eventually developing regional training centers are important. And, and this forum definitely can take a lead. In, in, in developing a regional training center in, in very near future, which could be a center where candidates from the, the neighboring countries, from SARC countries, even, even from Africa and Middle East can come down and, and learn because the, some of the limitations are fairly similar. And when I talk of training and education, I, I again think of it in, in, in two different uh, components or two different buckets. Access-specific learning that includes understanding the fundamentals of dialysis vascular access. I think that, sh that is prerequisite and essential for everybody who's taking care of a dialysis patient. Uh, it doesn't have to be an interventional nephrologist. And, and again, for radiologists, it's important to understand this. And for a surgeon, it's important to understand this. It's important to understand the pathophysiology behind access dysfunction, 
how to diagnose and access dysfunction, especially within the resource uh, limitations, how to utilize the efficacy of physical examination to monitor a patient. And, and that can be done, again, by, uh, by the patient, by the nurses, by the physician. And, and then to have a roadmap of if an access dysfunction is identified within the re resource limitation, what kind of treatment strategies the guidelines would, would come up with those. And then the second component is developing procedural skills. And, and this is for somebody who really wants to take a hands-on responsibility of keeping the access uh, functioning. Here, a structured training program, competency assessment, and a certification which will help with uh, getting uh, credentials within a hospital setting and also probably help with uh, medical legal issues down the road. The training model that uh, we have used all along so far in the, la in the last, this, this uh, specialty is roughly about 15, 18 years old, and the training model we have used is learning fundamentals and learning for procedural skills. Learning fundamentals is through didactic sessions, vascular access focus meetings like this one, and case-based workshops, uh, which we had some of it today. There was a simultaneous workshop uh, early part of the session, and we had a workshop in, in Delhi two days ago. Uh, procedural skills, again, simulation training with mannequins and models, and hands-on training with real patients. And all of this eventually can lead to uh, certification and competency. The challenges that we have currently, as far as uh, from the trainee's perspective, uh, the way the training is available right now, and this is not just here in India, it's even in, in, in the developed countries, the trainee is expected to give in a lot of sacrifices. There, is, there, is, there are very f limited centers that offer structured training programs. So from a trainee's perspective, they have to come up with their time, they have to come up with their uh, funding resources to, to be able to travel to different centers where they can learn these procedures. Again, these procedures take time, and it may not be always possible to get out of practice in, if they are in practice or, or sustain themselves in a different country, in a different setup. And, and, and that training often is piecemeal. So they, they, they come for four weeks, they learn a few things about catheter placement, they come for four more weeks, learn a few things about angioplasties, and then they spend another two to three weeks to learn more about complex endovascular procedures. And if they want to perform uh, AV fistulas, then yes, that takes even longer. And, and every country has its own licensing restrictions. They have their medical legal restrictions. So, so a lot of expectations from the trainee to come up with, with solutions to, to learn these techniques. And, and those can really be circumvented if there is a training center that can be established in this region. Uh, and, and, and training centers, rather than calling it interventional nephrology training centers, I would call it vascular access training centers. So if a surgeon is really interested and has not had exposure to that training during their residency, I think they need to go to those vascular access training centers to learn those procedures. Just because they can sew up vessels does not mean they can create fistulas. And I think it's equally important for all of us that this is a team approach and, and everyone should learn to play in the same sandbox. Again, we've gone through this uh, turf battles between specialties in the US. Uh, there was a lot of anxiety, but eventually uh, things have uh, settled. I would not say they've settled completely, but things have settled. And, and with the amount of workload, I think that nobody should be worried that there will be dearth of patients or dearth of procedures. And I think it should be a patient-centered focus. It should not be uh, a specific territorial approach. It should be from a fragmented approach to a team approach. Uh, and finally, advocacy. Uh, one really needs to incorporate vascular access education in medical schools and specialties and, and, and pay more emphasis on vascular access, establish task force to improve trained and expertise, uh, uh, train the trainers that can start off with regional centers, and national programs to improve healthcare coverage for dialysis, uh, vascular access care. And as far as research, I think it's equally important to establish registries to understand practice patterns, because once you know the practice patterns, you can have, uh, uh, you can have uh, guidelines that can impact outcomes and improvise based on, based on these practice patterns, improve quality of care, 
and develop innovative models of process of care that would be relevant for local needs. I would end at this point with this uh, famous statement from John Kennedy. Change is the law of life. Those who look only to the past or the present are certain to miss the future. Thank you very much for your attention.